for those of you who couldn't hear, the question was, when you allocate carbon emissions, it's really an international problem. It's not just a national problem. Uh, it's a global problem. And so you need to allocate internationally as well as within uh, nations. Uh, let me just say two quick things about that. First, the policy I just described, cap and dividend, is a policy that could be implemented by any government at any time and doesn't have to wait on an international agreement about how much ultimately is going to be the U.S. share, the Chinese share, the Indian share, etc. of the global uh, atmospheric uh, commons. And it's a policy that potentially could command support from the majority of the population because in every country, just as in the United States, the majority of the people would come out ahead in pocketbook terms as well as helping to leapfrog ahead in the clean energy transition towards the post-fossil fuel future that sooner or later is going to come. So you don't have to have that international architecture settled before you have a national policy. I think there's a scope for building up from the bottom, actually, even going below the nation to the state. California has its own uh, climate policy now, and, and I've argued for the same kind of thing in California. So that's one piece. Second piece is ultimately when we get to the international agreement, what should be the basis for that agreement? And I think the principles that I flashed up there briefly of the UN Framework Convention provide, you know, a platform on which to build. And that, there, there are two basic principles. Common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, right? So common but differentiated responsibilities means if you look at the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere, which is the problem, not everybody contributed equally to that. Not every country contributed equally to that. And the ones who contributed more have a bigger responsibility for trying to deal with the problem. That's one principle. So that means you know, we Americans, for example, have more responsibility than the peasants I used to live with in Bangladesh or the people of Africa. Right? The second principle is uh, their respective capabilities. So some countries, some people have more capability than others. They've got, they're wealthier, they've got more technological capability, etc. And in fact, the responsibilities and the capabilities tend to, you know, move along together. So it seems to me that a reasonable basis for any international agreement is going to be one in which the rich countries, the relatively high per capita income countries, take the lead and, and uh, help uh, through financial assistance and technical assistance, help uh, the poorer countries of the world move quickly in that transition to uh, clean sources of energy without going through the same route we went of burning a lot of coal and you know, pumping a lot more carbon. Uh, into the atmosphere. So what that implies in terms of the underlying allocation of rights in effect then is that the people of the poor countries are getting a fair amount of rights. You know, the rights aren't being based on, oh, we've pumped a lot of that, uh, carbon in the atmosphere and therefore we get a lot of rights. They're based on something more like equal per capita rights. So, you know, the individual Bangladeshi, the individual American, the individual Swede all have the same entitlement. That would be one basis for doing it that uh, sometimes uh, is, um, is proposed. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody's really worked out a magic solution to this problem. I think that greenhouse development rights framework that I suggested is about the most sophisticated treatment of this issue that I've seen, so I, I really recommend it. It's got a lot of discussion at these COP meetings at the uh, climate, international climate negotiations. But, uh, you know, Kyoto, finally on this point, was, was a kind of mishmash between these two principles, right? Because on the one hand, the Kyoto uh, Protocol, which was agreed in 1997 and now is expiring, um, uh, sort of half extended, um, said that, well, we'll have binding carbon emissions uh, reductions targets for the rich countries and not for the poor countries. So that's consistent with the Framework Convention. However, within the universe of rich countries, the system was, all right, we'll base it on how much you've historically emitted in the past. So that's, in effect, rewarding countries for their past contribution to the problem, right? And that, that cuts directly against the framework convention principle. So, you know, these issues are really still uh, in play and, um, and up for grabs. And uh, I think in the meantime, you know, countries, states, communities ought to move ahead and start working on their own policies to try to address the problem without waiting for the international uh, negotiators to get it figured out.